This lesson deals with the semiconductor diode. You can find these notes in the ECE302 ebook in chapter 2 starting on page 8. Previously we talked about having an ideal diode. The real diode actually has the same symbol, but we're going to fill in the arrowhead. We're going to define the voltage from anode to cathode and the current flowing from anode to cathode. If you were to plot the voltage versus the current, it would look quite different than the ideal diode. In the first quadrant it goes up actually exponentially. And then as the voltage goes negative, the current is very, very small. And eventually, we get what's called breakdown, where the diode conducts again. Now, how does this happen? Let's take a look at what a semiconductor diode is made of. It's a piece of silicon. Now, if you had a wire, it's a very good conductor. In other words, a low resistance. If you had an insulator, it's a very high resistance. A piece of silicon has a resistance something in the 1,000 ohms range. Sometimes we call this a semiconductor. It's not a open circuit or a short circuit, in other words, a conductor or an insulator, something in between. If you take that piece of silicon and take one part of it and expose it to a atom, say phosphorus, and then heat it up, the phosphorus atom takes the place of the silicon atom. Phosphorus has one more electron in its valence band than silicon does. And that extra electron is weakly held and so it breaks away very easily at room temperature. So what I've got on this right-hand side of the diode are a bunch of electrons that are free to move around. If you take the other side of the piece of silicon and expose it to boron, it has one less electron than silicon. Again, if you heat that up, what you've got is the absence of an electron. We call that actually a hole. We'll see shortly that electrons move from one side to the other, and holes move from one side to the other. That's kind of an odd concept, but if you think about an egg carton with an egg in it, and if you were to move the egg from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, just one egg in a carton, the hole would be appearing to be moving in the other direction. Electrons can move a little faster than holes can, and that will actually distinguish some of the kind of transistor and take a look at it. Let's take our semiconductor diode and put a voltage across it from anode to cathode such that the voltage is negative. In other words, the plus sign here and the minus sign here. What's going to happen with a piece of silicon? Well, the plus sign here is going to act like a magnet. It's going to attract the negative charge. The minus sign here is also going to attract the positive charge, and you're left with a region that doesn't have any free charge in it. So we have no current flowing. This is the case we call the reverse bias region on the previous page. I'll talk about breakdown in a little bit. Suppose we take that same diode and apply a positive voltage across it, where I've got the plus sign by the anode and the minus by the cathode. It's going to be a positive voltage. What's going to happen? The plus sign here is going to act like a magnet. It's going to repel the positive charge. But the minus terminal also attracts those positive charges. This is giving it a push, and this is giving it a pull. So we'll have positive charges moving from this direction and coming back. So one leaves here, comes back around, and gets back to where it came from. And it picks up energy along the way. This is our definition of current, as defined by Ben Franklin. There's also a bonus here. The minus terminal is repelling the negative charge, and the positive terminal is attracting the negative charge. So electrons are moving in this direction. We've got a double effect producing current in this direction. We have a positive current flowing, in fact, quite a bit of current flowing. Let's go back to our reverse bias condition. Suppose that I were to increase the magnitude of voltage across the diode, of course, make it more reverse biased. Eventually, as you made that voltage larger and larger, you create a larger and larger electric field. And this is strong enough to actually ionize the semiconductor atoms and create some free charge. Let me show what I mean by that on the previous page. Suppose that you created a negative charge here. This minus sign would give it a push, and this plus sign would give it a pull, and so electrons would start to move in this direction. And that would mean that our Ben Franklin direction of current was going in this direction. And so that lines up with our previous page about breakdown. So here we got this forward bias region we just talked about previously, and then here's this reverse bias that we talked about, but now as we make that voltage more and more negative, we begin to break down. This phenomenon is called an avalanche effect, where we get charge being able to move again this is named after Clarence Zener, who was an American physicist who was studying breakdowns in insulators. And this was developed at Bell Laboratories, which is the research arm of the telephone company. And they named it after Zener. By introducing impurities into the semiconductor, you can control where this occurs. Our diodes we're going to be taking a look at in the 303 lab, this breakdown voltage is at least 50 volts. and can be as high as 1,000 volts. By putting impurities in here, you can move this down and create a reference voltage. We're actually going to use that at the end of this chapter. Go back to page 10. William Shockley figured out an equation for the semiconductor diode based on taking experimental measurements. 
and kind of doing a curve fit with an exponential equation. Let's take a look at that on the next page. The Shockley equation is the following. The current in the diode is related to the voltage across the diode, not with a simple linear relationship, but with an exponential equation. So it's equal to I sub S times the quantity E to the V sub D over A to V sub T minus one. Where I sub S is called the saturation current, it has units of amps. Eta is called the emission coefficient and is dimensionless. And V sub T is called the thermal voltage. And the units on that are volts. The units of volts here and the units of volts here cancel. So we have E raised to a dimensionless quantity. And so I sub D is equal to something in amps. Although this is a very, very small number. He also figured out that the thermal voltage was related to temperature. And of course, that's why it's named that. And it's equal to KT over Q, where K is Boltzmann's constant, which is approximately 1.380662 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Temperature, in this case, is in degrees Kelvin. And Q is the charge on an electron. That's roughly 1.6021892 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. If you were to put them in that equation for V sub T at 27 degrees C, which is 300.15 degrees Kelvin, we have KT divided by Q, you get 25.865 millivolts. Now people approximate this as roughly 26 millivolts. And we'll do that in hand calculations. When we do comparisons with the SPICE program, I'm gonna use this value so we can see how our hand calculations then match up with the simulation results. The Shockley equation we had on the last page was solving for I sub D in terms of V sub D. But suppose you knew what I sub D is, could you solve for V sub D? I'll just solve this equation for V sub D, and let's do that. Divide by I sub S, bring this on the other side of the equation, so we have I sub D over I sub S plus one is equal to E to the V sub D over A to V sub T. Take the natural log of both sides of the equation, and the natural log of E is whatever the exponent is, and so that's just gonna be V sub D over A to V sub T. And then the natural log of this side of the equation is just this expression. If you cross multiply by A to V sub T, then you have that V sub D is equal to A to V sub T as a natural log of I sub D over I sub S plus one. Let me do an example to see how some of the numbers play out. Suppose that V sub D was 0.65 volts. For silicon, A is somewhere around one, between one and two roughly. I sub S for a semiconductor diode, typically on an integrated circuit is about 10 femtoamps. That's gonna be 10 times 10 to the minus 15th. Could you find I sub D at 27 degrees C? We have the equation, so it's gonna plug in the fact that if we measure the voltage across the diode, and we knew the value of I sub S, and we know the value of eta, and we know roughly the value of V sub T at room temperature, we could then calculate the value of I sub D. Here we're raising the exponent of E to a very large number, actually, because we have one over 26 milli here. We end up getting 72 times 10 to the ninth. So we're gonna multiply that by a small number, and the product of a small number times a big number can be anything, but in this case, it's in microamps. What's interesting is the term that's here is really small compared to this because of the large number that's here. The one here has some interesting properties. So when we're in the first quadrant, the number one has very little effect. In fact, I have a special name for that. We'll take a look at it on the next page. Having that one term in the equation makes it really hard to solve the equation. We are in the first quadrant and the current's beginning to flow. In other words, we have in this case something on the order of almost a milliamp. We call that strongly forward bias. That means you can throw away the one and roughly this equation would predict the full Shockley equation. Then likewise solving for V sub D, we had the, this ratio plus one. If I sub D is large compared to I sub S, the one doesn't have much of an effect. Why is the one there? Well, what would happen on this previous page if we had a negative voltage across the diode? Suppose that the voltage across the diode was a minus 0.65. That would make this 10 to the minus ninth. And this term would be very small. We just have this term right here. This represents the current when the voltage across the diode is slightly negative, but not in breakdown. I said the current there was small and I wasn't kidding. It's pretty tiny, usually larger than this for a lab diode, but this would be the size you'd expect to see in an integrated circuit diode. So when that happens, the exponential term and the natural log term don't have much of an effect. So we just say that I sub D is roughly minus I sub S. Shockley put that minus one in there to take that into account. Now the Shockley equation doesn't predict the breakdown voltage. We'll talk about the equation when that occurs a little bit later in the course. There's not a very really useful formula involving the Shockley equation. That's calculating a change in voltage. Suppose that we have two data points, an ID one and an ID two. 
And let's solve the difference equation here. A to b sub t is common to both. I've got the natural log of the first term minus the natural log of the second term. But the difference of two natural logs is their ratio. The natural log of this term divided by this term is the same as the subtraction. What happens here is the i sub s drops out. i sub s is very hard to measure. We'll use a trick in the 303 lab by taking some special data points. If it's possible not to have to calculate it, that'll make things a lot easier, because eta is somewhere between one and two for silicon. So our equation then for a change in voltage is eta V sub T times the natural log of ID2 over ID1. Again, what's interesting here is you don't have to know the value of I sub S to be able to calculate the change. Let me do an example. Suppose that eta were equal to one, V sub T is about 26 millivolts at room temperature. Then what is the change in voltage if I sub D doubles? Well, let's take our equation here and then set the value of I sub D1 equal to a known value called I sub D, and I sub D2 is twice that value. These cancel and they get the natural log of two. One times 26 millivolts, natural log of two is about 18 millivolts. Just an 18 millivolt change in the voltage across a diode, the current doubles. And these are some properties of the semiconductor diode. 